Well, good morning, everyone. It's really good to be able to join with you in worship this morning. You'll notice that the background is very different this morning. It's normally my kitchen, but this morning I'm at Baxter. I decided that I would come down and I would prepare and lead this service in the space that we're all familiar with and encourage us to know that eventually things will return to normal and we will be able to gather and we will be able to share together in worship in the place that we're familiar with. But for the time being, we can't do that. But I can come down to church and I can lead worship from this space. So I thought that I would start to do that and we'd share together. Um, Worship's going to be slightly different this morning in that you're going to need to have the, the, the sheet that I sent to you uh, for the words. Um, we're going to use the words for communion together because we're sharing communion this morning. But also, you're going to need the words of the hymns because they're not going to appear on the screen this morning. We're going to do things slightly differently, but you'll find out later as to why. But it is good that we can come together and we can share worship. Even if we are still separate you can see that things are beginning to return to a new sense of normality. So let's worship God together. And we're going to share in our call to worship first of all. And the words of this call to worship will appear on the screen. Um, And I'd like to invite you to join with me in sharing the words that are in the bold type. So let's worship God together as we enter into worship on this Trinity Sunday. All glory to our living God, all praise to our Creator, glorious in splendour, glorious in majesty. Let us worship God together. All glory to our living God. Let all the earth cry glory. So with those words, uh, in our hearts, in our minds, and in our ears, we're going to sing together, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. And this morning we're going to be accompanied by Lucas, um, who plays the piano and the organ at Worcester. So we're going to be accompanied by him as we sing these words together. So let's join in and sing. Holy, holy, holy. Introduction. Love and purity. 
unity. And now let's come before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together. One God, holy God, sovereign of creation and source of all life and blessing. You are all beauty, all justice, all truth. In the beginning, all that was made was good, and we could see your image in ourselves, drawing all into harmony with your joy. Glory to God, sing praise. One God, holy God, sovereign of creation and source of all grace and hope. You are all compassion, all forgiveness, all mercy. When we fell into wrongdoing, you became our saviour and we could see how you carried our suffering on your cross, drawing all into healing through your resurrection. Glory to God. Sing praise. One God, holy God, sovereign of creation and source of all energy and love. You are all variety, all plenty, all riches. As we become partners in your purposes, we receive your word. And we can see order and diversity, pattern and fruitfulness, drawing all into service, rest and praise. Glory to God. Sing praise. Forgive us, loving creator, that we have failed to honour you with worship of simple purity and lives of humble truth. Forgive us, loving Saviour, that we have failed to follow you in your path of devoted service and your offering of generous obedience. Forgive us, loving Spirit, that we have failed to receive you in each other, in your care for all creation and your witness to the Father and the Son. Accept, Father God, through your own steadfast mercy, through the depth of your saving grace in your Son, and the cleansing of your Spirit who makes us whole, that we may give glory to your holy name this day and forever. Amen. And so we gather all our prayers together, praying the words that Jesus has taught all his disciples to pray, praying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. So we're going to continue in worship now as we listen to our reading from Matthew's Gospel. And this morning that's going to be read to us by Penny from Worcester. So thank you, Penny. I'll let you introduce the reading to us. So let's listen and see what God has to say to us this morning. Thank you, Penny. The reading today is from Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20, and I'm reading from the Good News Bible. The eleven disciples went to the hill in Galilee, where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, even though some of them doubted. Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptise them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you and I will be with you always to the end of the age. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much for bringing that reading to us. We're now going to continue in worship as we spend some moments in reflection. Uh, last week, one of my colleagues in the United Reformed Church put on uh, Facebook a video of himself playing uh, Living God, Your Joyful Spirit Breaks the Bounds of Time and Space. Now, I absolutely love that particular hymn that is found 
in Rejoice and Sing at number 530. It's normally sung to Abbots Lee, and it's a hymn that speaks about mission and going out into the community and telling others about what we know of God's love and good news to us that is discovered in Jesus. But my colleague uh, from, from, from another church, his name's Malcolm Fife, um, has chosen to, to sing this particular hymn to a different tune. And I was so taken by it that I asked him if we could uh, have this in our act of worship this week. And he's agreed for me to share it with you. So this is Malcolm Fife singing, Living God, Your Joyful Spirit Breaks the Bounds of Time and Space. So let's listen to these words of this song and let's reflect further on those words that we've heard from Matthew's Gospel this morning. Thank you, Malcolm. <laughs> Joyful spirit breaks the bounds of time and space, rests in love upon your people, drawn together in this place. Here we join in glad thanksgiving, here rejoice to pray and praise, Lord of all our traditions, Lord of all our future days. As your bread may we be broken, scattered in community, we who know your greatest blessings called to share Christ's ministry. May we gently lead each other, share our hunger and our thirst. Learn that only through our weakness shall we know the strength of Christ. Feel frustration, hurt and strain By your Spirit's quiet compulsion Draw us back to you again Draw us through the bitter searching When our confidence is lost Give us hope from desolation Arms outstretched upon a cross Living God, your power surrounds us As we face the way Christ trod Challenge us to fresh commitments to the purposes of God Called to share a new creation Called to preach a living word Promised all the joys of heaven Through the grace of Christ our Lord And now it's our turn to sing again. We're going to sing a very powerful Isaac Watts hymn, which we've sung before during this lockdown period, but I think it's beautiful. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. So let's sing these words together. Thank you, Lucas, for leading us in this hymn. <laughs> So uh... 
cafe, the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? His dying crimson like a robe spreads all his body on the tree. Then am I dead to all the globe, and all the globe is dead to me. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. One of the biggest challenges we face as disciples who were sent out to proclaim the gospel to all the world and baptise people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is how can we describe the God that we serve and trust and have faith in? After all, our God is three persons who are mysteriously one. And inevitably, when we seek to describe God, we get responses like, well, I quite like Jesus because he's human like me. And I quite like his teaching on how I should live and how I should relate to other people. But I don't quite understand who God the Father is. I don't actually quite like the way in which he's described in the Old Testament. And in, and in the Old Testament, God the Father is actually a bit scary. And, and the way he relates to his people is, quite frankly, cold, callous and distant. So I don't really like him. And by the way, if we're on the subject of uh, don't liking particular aspects of God, I certainly don't like the Holy Spirit because that's something that is supernatural and impossible to control. And I like being in control of my own life. So in reality, I only really like Jesus. So what starts off as an attempt to share the good news ends in an exercise in cherry picking the best bits, the bits that we like of the relationship we have with God, and then, you know, leaving the rest because that makes us uneasy. But the reality is, in order to be authentic to the good news that we are called upon by Jesus to go and proclaim, we need to present the whole picture of God and hold, even if it makes us feel uncomfortable, the identity of God as three persons who has called us into relationship with him and has transformed our lives and the life of our world so that we can experience God in all his beauty and fullness. Now to do that, we need to look at each of the persons of the Trinity, to have a clearer understanding of who it is 
that we are in fact in relationship with. So let's do that now by looking in turn at each person of the Trinity and ask ourselves the question, how do we relate to the Trinity that is enabling us to understand what it means to be in relationship with God? So firstly, let's look at God the Father. As I've already said, lots of people feel uncomfortable with trying to understand their relationship with God as a father for a whole variety of different reasons. Perhaps, and this is perhaps the primary reason why people struggle with understanding God as father, um, perhaps people haven't had a good relationship with their earthly father. And so to try and describe God as a parent figure that they haven't got on with in their own lives as they've grown up isn't quite frankly, going to draw them closer into a relationship with God. They're going to be put off by describing God as a father if they haven't had a good relationship with their earthly father. But for the purposes of this reflection, I don't want to dwell too much on this. Instead, I want to reflect on the thought that many people have, which is, They don't like the God of the Old Testament. And that's often where we find God as a father being described. Or it's where we understand God the Father as an identity to come from. God in the Old Testament does indeed appear to be cold, callous, distant and unloving, and demanding a respect and a worship from his people in an atmosphere not of love, but of fear. God appears to be a judge who delights in punishing his people if they stray to the left or the right. And most of the stories seem to have an air of bloodthirstiness about them. But I think we need to be cautious in making that judgment of God the Father. After all, God creates a perfect world and wants to delight in his creation by being in relationship with humanity who are seen to be the pinnacle of that creation. God wants to be in relationship with humanity as co-partners, co-workers and co-stewards in the creation of his world. God intends for humanity to be in an everlasting and all-loving relationship with him. And if humanity hadn't strayed from that relationship to go their own way, according to the Old Testament writers, this all-loving relationship would have lasted. But as a petulant child rebels against their parents, Humanity rebelled against God. And as we know, because of that rebellion, sin entered the world. And you know, for the remainder of the Old Testament, God the Father does express judgment, but it's always with an air of frustration and pain that humanity have abandoned the relationship that they had with God at the beginning to follow their own path. Now I know that that is really an oversimplification of what God in the Old Testament is like. But I'm sure that you get the point. It is not that God is cold and callous and bloodthirsty. Instead, we hear literal pain. God laments the pain that the broken relationship humanity has with him has caused. And he longs for the time when the relationship can be restored. You know, if you listen to the words of the prophets, when when the people of Israel have rebelled and they've been taken into exile as a result, they long themselves to return to a loving relationship with God. But we hear the pain of God being expressed. He says, look, I want to be in relationship with you. I want there to be a moment in time when all of this will be restored to you. There is a time when that's going to happen. 
And that restoration will come, God says. And of course, when we come to the New Testament, we realise that that restoration plan is coming to fruition. And of course, we know that's coming to fruition through God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. The life of Jesus, his teaching and his ministry, and then his death and his resurrection, I think people say are the easiest part of the Trinity for us to understand. As I said, it's probably because Jesus is human. And so to understand what it means to be human with all our frailty and weakness, we can relate to Jesus. Jesus comes, he lives among us, he demonstrates through his life and his ministry how we should live our lives. But because he is human, because he shares what it means to be human, we can relate to him. Jesus understands our emotional response to life. He understands the highs and the lows we go through. And because of his teaching and his ministry, he demonstrates to us what life can and should really be like. I was watching a, uh, a, a presentation of Jesus uh, in, a, in a Good Friday play from the 1960s. And in that, we see Jesus powerfully demonstrating what to be in relationship with God and with each other is, is really about. And you can hear the emotion within Jesus by the actor who plays him as to why God is so frustrated with humanity. You can hear Jesus saying, look, I want to tell you things that were laid down at the foundation of the earth. I want you to be in relationship with each other and with God in a way that was always meant to be. And because we hear the emotion in Jesus' voice, and because that actor from the 1960s plays Jesus so beautifully, we can understand and relate to Jesus as a human being. You see, God the Son coming to earth in a form that we can understand enables us to connect better with God. Jesus is a window through which we see what God truly wants the world to be like. And it is through Jesus that we see what love really is. And of course, that love reaches its climax through Jesus' death and resurrection. This love leads to a restoration plan for humanity and for those who respond to God's love through Jesus and, and seek to have that personal relationship with God through Jesus, restoration occurs. And the co-partnership that God longed to have with humanity from the beginning starts again. There is a return to the Garden of Eden. And it is secured in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. And through the role that he plays as God, as son, we understand what real family relationship are like. Jesus demonstrates that we are all God's beloved children and are adopted into his family. You remember, I'm at the moment of Jesus' baptism where he comes up out of the water. He hears that amazing blessing from heaven. You are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. Jesus, in that moment, is demonstrating to us what true relationship, what true family is all about. And through the cross and through its power, God can say to each one of us, you are my beloved child. In you, I am well pleased. But of course, a restoration plan and being part of one big family and being adopted into that family are nothing unless we tell others about it. And so enable that family network to expand and to grow. And that's only achieved when we trust in God as Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inspires us 
to go out into the world and tell others the good news of what we have discovered for ourselves. The Holy Spirit nurtures and empowers our faith in God. And if we allow the Spirit to do its work within us, the good news is shared and lives are transformed. We worry about what we are to say about our relationships with God because we often find ourselves lost for words at the bigness of God's love. You know, it sounds so simple to describe love. If I was to ask you to sum up your relationship with God, you would simply say, it's about love. And yet, when we are asked to put that into words, when we're asked to go and tell others about that love that we've discovered for ourselves, we just simply struggle. We're lost for words. We don't know what we are to say that will convince other people about the good news that we've discovered. But Scripture tells us that we needn't worry about that because through the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity, and if we trust in all its power, the words we need will simply pour forth from our lips. Scripture says, don't worry about what you have to say. Don't worry because on the day you are called to account for what you believe, the Holy Spirit will speak in your heart. Of course, all of that means allowing God to come and take control of our lives. And sometimes that is incredibly hard to do and also to accept. But if we are to truly see God's kingdom grow, we need to trust that the Holy Spirit will lead us to places God wants us to go. And if God as Holy Spirit is working for good in our lives, we should be comforted by its presence within us rather than being alienated by its power. We should ask for the Holy Spirit to come and fill our hearts and our minds with the knowledge and the wonder of God. Because in doing so, the awe and the wonder that we feel will enable us to simply share the love of God that we have discovered and be able to go out and tell the good news. But it doesn't mean, and it doesn't take away the challenge of proclaiming the good news or enabling understanding of who the God is that we serve and trust. You know, the best way that I can think, and it kept coming back to me again and again this week, the best way I think that we can reflect on the relationship that God has with us in the Trinity is through the relationship that Moses has with God in the Old Testament. When Moses met with God at the burning bush, he was told to go and tell the people of Israel that the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob had sent him to them. And when Moses hears God speaking about what he wants him to do, Moses sceptically says and asks of God, well, who are you? What am I to say about you when I go to the people of Israel? They're not going to identify you as someone that they can trust. And God says, I am what I am. And it is I am that is sending Moses to the people of Israel. Now Moses, after a lot of fear and a lot of doubt and a lot of anxiety, trusted and had faith. And as that faith and confidence grew, he was able to lead God's people to freedom from the slavery of Egypt to the promised land. Now, like Moses, we are called and are being called to go to God's people, who are those people not only in our church community, but those beyond the four walls of our community, and say this, I am 
has sent us to them. But unlike Moses, we have the knowledge of what I am has done for his people in the life of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we can tell them that God has transformed their lives so that they can again experience life as it was always intended. Now they may say to us, well, I already experience life as I want to. But there will always be within someone's life an element of selfishness, an element of doubt, an element of distrust. Because as humans, we have broken our relationships with God and with each other. But we can say that those relationships have been repaired because of God in Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We can say that we can come into God's presence and we can see what the world was always intended from the foundation of creation until now. We can say God in Jesus has told us how we should live our lives. And we should set aside our selfishness, our distrust, our doubt, and just believe. And in believing, we'll be transformed and we'll be able to celebrate life as it was always meant to. And I am in both Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And through that powerful relationship, renewal has come and we are invited to join in with it. So let's do that. Let's join in and let's trust that through God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, our lives and the life of our world is being transformed and renewed so that we can walk the way of the good news of God's kingdom each day of our lives. Let's do that. Let's join in and let's seek to share what we know of this amazing relationship that God has given to us. Amen. And now, in response to what we've heard, let's come before God in prayer. Let's share our prayers of intercession, our prayers for the world, our prayers for each other, and prayers for our church. Let's pray together. Creator God, creation was conceived by you, brought to birth by you, and is continually sustained by your parental love. In gratitude, we pray for the world, that its beauty and variety may be treasured and its riches and resources used responsibly and fairly, that its rulers and leaders may seek your guidance and govern with justice, wisdom and compassion, that humankind may acknowledge all that unites us and strive to show one another respect and understanding, that the wonders of creation and human love may lead us to seek and to know you, living God. In your love and mercy, hear our prayer. Saviour God, in Christ you came to seek and to save the lost, to offer us new life and make us one with you. In gratitude, we pray for all humankind in its need, for those who are lost in poverty and hunger, their lives a dehumanising struggle for existence, for those who are lost in warfare or conflict, their lives in the constant shadow of death, for those who are lost in sickness or sorrow, their lives eaten up by anger, regret or despair, for those who were lost in self-destructive sin, their lives shallow, empty, short on love. And we remember before you this morning, communities across the US who are struggling because of the pain of racism. We pray for your compassion, your love, for a sense of renewal, Lord, for a sense of 
treating each other with respect and dignity, for recognising that all lives matter, irrespective of colour or gender or ethnicity. We pray, Lord, for a time when people won't be the butt-end of others' jokes or, or others' suspicion and selfishness. We pray for a time when transformation and renewal will occur. In your love and mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, you breathe life and power into God's people, uniting them in love and praise. In gratitude, we pray for the church, asking that you will pour your many gifts upon us, gifts of prophecy, healing, teaching, speaking, of faith, service, guidance and understanding. We pray for our churches in Kidderminster and Worcester, that you will equip us to fulfil our calling. And we pray for all those dear to our hearts who need our prayers at this time. In a moment of silence, we bring those people close to you and ask that you would minister to them in their need. For those who are sick, we ask for your healing. For those who are bereaved, we ask for your peace. For those who are anxious, we pray for your strength and the embrace of your love. And Lord, we pray for ourselves, that we would know your presence within us and that we would be renewed and re-energised as your disciples. In your love and mercy, hear our prayer. And in the name of Jesus, the Son of God and the Son of Man, we make our prayers. Amen. So we come now to a time in our service where we gather at the table where love bids us welcome and we can renew our faith and our trust in God as we share together in the Feast of Holy Communion. As you will notice, I have returned to my kitchen for this part of our service. And the reason for that is just simply per, for, for hygiene reasons. Um, I can't guarantee that in the church um, that there is good hygiene. Um, and therefore, until we've had the church deep cleaned, I can't actually uh, conduct a communion service from behind the communion table there. Um, but uh, I hope that you'll just bear with me in that um, and uh, we will uh, in time be able to, to share communion together online, um, not from my kitchen, um, but from the church itself. But um, it is good that we can gather and we can share together in this most important moment in the church's life. We can share together in this feast and we can remember that Jesus suffered and died in order that we might have life and know it in all its fullness. So let's share in this moment together. Let's, let's get our, our bread and our wine ready to share together in this feast. So hear the gracious words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Anyone who comes to me, I will never turn away. So we hear the narrative of the institution of this feast, as it is recorded for us by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, 
the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, and you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and following his example, we take this cup, and we take this bread, and we give thanks to God. Let us pray. With joy, we give you thanks and praise, almighty God, source of all life and love, that we live in your world, that you are always creating and sustaining it by your power, and that you have so made us that we can know and love you, trust and serve you. We give you thanks that you loved the world so much that you gave your only Son, that everyone who has faith in him may not die, but have eternal life. We thank you that Jesus was born among us, that he lived our common life on earth, that he suffered and died for us, that he rose again, and that he is always present with us through his Holy Spirit. We thank you that we can live in the faith that your kingdom will come, and that in life, in death, and beyond death, you are with us. Holy Lord God, by what we do here in remembrance of Christ, we celebrate his perfect sacrifice on the cross, and his glorious resurrection and ascension. We declare that he is Lord of all, and we prepare for his coming in his kingdom. We pray that through your Holy Spirit, this bread may be for us the body of Christ, and this wine the blood of Christ. Accept our sacrifice of praise as we eat and drink at his command, and unite us to Christ as one body with him, and give us strength to serve you in the world, and to you, one holy and eternal God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we give praise and glory, now and for ever. Amen. So as our Lord has commanded us, the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he also took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So the bread that we break is the communion of the body of Christ, and the cup which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. So let us take this bread and this wine and feed on Christ in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. So let's serve each other first of all, the body of Christ as we share this bread together. This is the communion of the body of Christ. Let's take and let's eat. So the communion of the body of Christ broken for me and for you. Let's eat and remember.
And now, let's take the cup of wine together. This cup is the new covenant in the blood of Christ, shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Drink of it. This is the communion of the blood of Christ. Let's drink and remember. So let us pray together. Most gracious God, we praise you for what you have given and for what you have promised us here. You have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. You have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us for your service. Now we give ourselves to you and we ask that our daily living may be part of the life of your kingdom and that our love may be your love, reaching out into the life of the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we're going to close our worship now together as we sing. Thou whose almighty word chaos and darkness heard and took their flight. We sing together and thank you, Lucas, for leading us in that hymn. Let's sing together, everyone. <laughs> took their flight. Hear us, we humbly pray, and where the gospel day sheds not its glorious ray, let there be light. Thou who didst come to bring on thy redeeming wing, healing and sight, Health to the sick in mind, sight to the inly blind, now to all humankind, let there be light. Spirit of truth and love, life-giving holy dove, speed forth thy flight. Move all the water space, bearing the lamp of grace, and in earth's darkest place let there be light. Holy and blessed three, glorious trinity, wisdom, love, might, Boundless as ocean's tide, rolling in fullest pride, through the world far and wide, let there be light. And now bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. Go in peace to serve the Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be with you and with all whom you love, this day and forever. Amen. Thank you everyone for sharing with me in this act of worship this morning. I hope that you have been blessed by this time where we can gather together in this online way and that you are feeling hopeful and renewed and re-energised 
by what we have shared together this morning. I pray that you would have a blessed rest of your day and that uh, I look forward to seeing you again online uh, in the coming weeks. Um, in terms of notices for this week, I think there is a Bible study tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Uh, but be guided by what the magazine says. Um, I can't quite remember what I actually agreed that I would do. But there is no midweek service this coming, coming Thursday. Um, I've decided to alternate uh, the midweek uh, services. Um, so there will be a midweek service a week on Thursday, not this coming Thursday. Um, but for the moment, um, I hope that you have a blessed rest of your day, that you continue to stay safe and stay well. And I look forward to welcoming you to another uh, um, online act of worship very soon. Take care for now, everyone. God bless.